Ah, 4th edition D&D. Loved by some for its crunch and flexibility, maligned by others as too video gamey and complex. While this edition of the game was short-lived due to a host of reasons, that doesn't mean we can't still find gems of juicy advice and rules to rip from the game. Continuing my series on great stuff to mine from 4E, here are seven rules you can pilfer directly from the player's handbook and drop into D&D or any other tabletop game to spice it up as needed. Let's get into it. First up, we have character roles. For whatever reason, 5e did away with the idea of there being defined roles on the battlefield and in non-combat situations. Sure, experienced players have come to define their own non-official roles such as support, frontline, infiltrator, the quote, face, etc. But these aren't officially in the rulebooks. But I've always felt like having defined roles is a great shorthand to helping new players pick a class they want to play. One thing I did during the height of the Marvel movie era was ask potential newbies, who's your favorite Marvel character? Because there were 5e e class parallels with most of them. If someone says the Hulk, point them toward Barbarian. If they say Hawkeye, that probably equals Ranger or Arcane Archer Fighter. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison, but you get the idea. Well, the 4th edition PHB says, Each character class specializes in one of four basic functions in combat control in area offense, defense, healing, and support, and focused offense. The roles embodied by these are controller, defender, leader, and striker. I think you can also toss the face in there as a role named diplomat or negotiator, possibly as a subset of the leader role. Just think of them as easy categories to get a noob started by asking them the types of actions they want to do in the game, and then drill down into a class that can help them do what they find most fun. Second on our list is retraining. In 4E, there was a systemized process for what happens if a player wants to swap out a feat, power, or skill at level up. In 5E, there is very little of this. Some classes like Warlock can change spells at level up, largely because more powerful versions of those spells become available. But there's no actual process for what to do in 5E if you come to decide that taking the mobile feat was a mistake, or if you actually hate being a ranger and you should have been a druid instead. Most of the time, there is an unofficial rule that if you're not having fun playing the game with your current playbook or class, the DM should let you switch things up. Unless there's an incredibly specific reason why it wouldn't work, like you're a warlock and your patron is deeply tied into the narrative of the campaign, but even then, there are ways to retcon things to make it happen. Otherwise, you're just kind of being a jerk DM to force a player to keep on playing something they don't enjoy. But my whole point with this is, why not systematize this for 5e? Sure, you can say, uh, guys, Mackenzie wants her character Caraxes to change from bard to sorcerer, so we're just gonna pretend she was a sorcerer this whole time. Cool? Cool. But you know how in Baldur's Gate 3 at your camp, you get that magic mirror to respec your character? Why not do something like that in your game? Especially if you're not wild about the idea of simply hand-waving and retconning things. Make it a quest to go visit the holy mirror on the mountaintop to change your class or your feats or your ability scores. Why not? Make it a part of the narrative and Caraxes can say to the other PCs, I feel like I've always had innate sorcerer magic, but I never knew how to tap into it, so that's why I trained as a bard. But if we venture to the peak of Mount Hergishmerga, there I can gaze into the holy mirror and become what I was always meant to be. Or just hand wave it. Either way, let players respec if they're unhappy. Don't be a Grinch about it. Real quick, since I have you, could I get a like and subscribe below? It only takes a second and it helps us both out and make sure that you click all next to notifications. Next up, let's talk about residuum. If you watch Critical Role, that word may seem familiar, but Matt Mercer's version is a little different than what 4E did. In 4th edition, there's a ritual spell named Disenchant Magic Item and casting it vaporizes the item, leaving behind a silvery dust named residuum. This substance is considered concentrated magic and can be used as spell components or as a currency. I love the idea of straight up stealing this for 5e. Here are two scenarios I could see this residuum substance being incredibly useful. First, when the party finds a magic item that no one wants or needs, gotten a warlock but the group finds a rod of the pact keeper thanks to a random roll on a treasure table, sure, you can lug it around until you find a magic item dealer willing to buy it, but what if you could just perform a ritual to break it down to its magical essence and then apply that magic to a different item? 
Which brings me to my second use case, the special sword. Have you ever created a level one character who has a weapon that was important to their backstory, but then as you level up, that non-magical long sword now becomes a burden because you're facing monsters resistant to non-magical damage? In campaign three of Critical Role, Liam O'Brien's PC Orem had a special sword, and Matt Mercer eventually included a scene where he was able to place that sword into a magical sheath to enchant it. But what if you just had some of this residuum powder? You could make it so that they have to visit a certain magic shop to break down those items, or learning the ritual to do it yourself is a custom feat or ability a PC has to earn in some way. And then you could make the actual breaking down process into a downtime activity, maybe requiring rolls to succeed and see how much residuum you can collect from each attempt. This gives the party more flexibility in how they use their magic items and also more downtime projects. 5e is not great with downtime, so more options there is better. Fourth on the list is intangible rewards. The fourth edition PHB lists these as noble titles, medals and honors, favors, and reputation, and suggests giving these out as quest rewards at times. I like this idea because while finding gold and magic items is awesome, they shouldn't be the only currency in the game that matters. You got a cleric who wants to pray at an exclusive temple in the big city? Well, they've got to earn the title of Advanced Acolyte before being let in, and they've got to complete a side quest to get that. Favors are also a great form of currency to have in campaigns. When the party is in a bind, Knowing that the Duke owes them a favor is a great resource to have in the back pocket. Also, pinning medals on the chests of your heroes makes the players feel good, especially when they walk around town and then children point and say, look, mummy, it's those adventurers who saved our town from the fire giants. Players love that stuff. The recognition makes them feel like actual heroes. Next is a quick one, and that is bloodied. In 4E, when a monster or PC drops to half their hit points, they are considered bloodied and the DM would often tell the player when it's true for a monster. For the life of me, I can't figure out why WotC got rid of this for 5th edition. It's so handy. Plus, players are constantly asking, does that monster look hurt? Which one of them seems the most injured? And since they're gonna ask anyway, just use bloodied as a shorthand to fend off those questions. And speaking of trying to glean info about monsters, let's talk about monster knowledge checks. In 4E, you can make a specific skill check with defined DCs to learn valuable things about monsters, like their name, type, abilities, resistances, and vulnerabilities, etc. Matt Mercer made a monk subclass for Marisha Ray called the Way of the Cobalt Soul that has a specific ability to do this named Extract Aspects. But I like the way 4E has tiered levels of knowledge based on a check. One thing is that as a DM, I know a lot about monster stat blocks, which puts me in a weird position when I'm a player in someone else's game. For example, I know that vampires take acid damage if they end their turns in running water. But then we come to this awkward gray area where it's unclear if or how my PC would know this info. It can be tricky to avoid metagaming in these circumstances. So it feels like the most fair option is for the DM to offer a check, be it nature or investigation, medicine, maybe insight. And then the DM can have a list of specific DCs, maybe tied to the creature's challenge rating, to learn clues about them. And this is a good chance for a narrative moment. Let's say I get a nat 20 on my nature check to examine the vampire at the start of combat. The DM could tell me about the running water thing and then say, okay, so tell us how your character knows this. And then I would improv a story about how I saw my uncle fight a vampire when I was young or whatever. Finally, let's talk about how 4E handles personality. I've gone on at length before about how I think 5E's ideals, bonds, and flaws is a dumb system that's too vague and not very useful. I much prefer the way 4E does it, essentially by asking you a series of questions to your PC. Then the answers basically become tags that make up your character's personality. They're broken down into social interactions, decision points, and dire straits. Questions like, how optimistic are you has these options, enthusiastic, grim, hopeful, self-assured, fatalistic, or brooding. Under the dire straits category, a question is, how do you feel when faced with setbacks? And the options are stoic, vengeful, driven, bold, happy-go-lucky, and impassioned. Now the trick with these is to make them the basis for your personality, but not turn them into a role-play prison. We all know many character traits come out at the table in real time, but having these simple one-word tags can help out a lot when you're first navigating a brand new character for a campaign, so copy down these questions and maybe try building your next character with them. 
And there we go, seven rules from the 4E Player's Handbook that can spice up your 5E game or any TTRPG, really. Until next time, this is GM Jim, reminding you that it's fine to play the game you like, the way you like, regardless of what anyone else says, including me. Take care.